TED Talk wearing a mushroom burial suit, as you heard. And the suit uses mushrooms to help decompose the body, clean the toxins, and deliver nutrients to plant roots. And in the four years since that talk, I've heard a number of responses from all over the world. And the first bucket of responses I call, what the F? So I heard, this might be the best way to prevent future zombie attacks. I also heard, I would love to be your mushroom. A lot of people wanted to donate something to me. So I heard things like, I'd like to be a living su test subject for you. And then, my father is 85 and exceptionally eccentric. I feel he would be an excellent candidate for your mushroom berries. I don't know that you can actually donate people who are not you. Um, I also heard, I'm saving my nail clippings and hair for you to feed the mushrooms. Uh, please don't send those to me. I also went to a funeral convention um, where I heard from funeral directors a range of responses from, this is disgusting, to this is the future of the funeral industry. A lot of the responses also had to do with fear. Um, one person wrote to me and said, you are a disgrace to the death and dying process. I wish you would hurry up and put that mushroom soup to use. It's probably the most colorful death threat I've ever heard. And I heard, are you creating a parasite? Will this mushroom eat me while I'm still alive? And the answer is no, because you have an immune system. I also heard, I love mushrooms, and the thought of them transforming my body into something good for nature makes me happy and less afraid of death. Me too. I also heard from a lot of people who wanted to join the mission. And one person said, I want to inform you that I am willing to assist you in your dream by any means necessary. It's a little bit scary to me. <laughs> and two of these folks um, have become my co-conspirators in the company that grew out of the project. And the company name is Coeo. So we have Mike Ma on the left and Claire McNamara on the right. And then many people also wrote to say, I want the burial suit. I want to be buried in this suit. One person wrote, it's precisely the way I want my remains to be handled. Return to the earth via our mushroom allies. I agree with that. And then also, how do I acquire this mushroom suit? And is it legal to bury my body in this suit without a vault or a coffin? And the answer is yes, of course. But of the more than 1,000 people that wrote to me and said that they wanted to be buried in this suit, it turns out that very few of them have even taken one step toward making a plan. 70% actually of our super fans are, and our early adopters had done nothing yet. So even our super fans faced some significant hurdles and needed some help. And maybe they were a little bit scared too. All of this told me that our biggest hurdles we're not about gaining traction or manufacturing or sales, but about overcoming our psychological and our social hurdles, our fear and denial of death. So I knew that I needed to make the suit both emotionally and socially accessible to people. I learned about design thinking, which is a human-centered approach to design that begins with embedding in people's lives to really uncover our deeper, unmet human needs. So I made a beeline to the D School at Stanford University where we teach design thinking, and I spent a year in a fellowship applying design thinking to the project. And in the middle of that year, I got an email from a man named Dennis White. So this is Dennis. He is 64. He's a master carpenter who's now retired. And he's a father and a husband. And Dennis is probably one of the most generous and charismatic people I've ever met. I think he's larger than life. A year ago, Dennis was diagnosed with primary progressive aphasia, PPA. It's a rare illness that erodes the brain, uh, beginning with the language center. So Dennis was told that his PPA would lead to dementia and eventually end his life. <clears throat> 
And when Dennis's family learned that he was sick, they completely rallied around him. They found the best neurologist in Boston to take care of him. They held multiple fundraisers for PPA. And one of his kids even moved back home to be his caretaker. He's a beautiful family. Dennis's doctors told him he had less than a year to live, so he began to think about his funeral and asked us for a burial suit. Above all, Dennis wanted to return to the earth. And in his email, he wrote and quoted Neil deGrasse Tyson, who says, I request that my body be buried, not cremated, so that the energy contained gets returned to the earth, so the flora and fauna can dine upon it, just as I have dined upon flora and fauna. Dennis wanted an alternative to the funeral options that were available to him. He'd had some pretty bad experiences before. He also knew that time was running out because every day he was losing more and more of his ability to communicate and to work with his family to develop his funeral. So last March, uh, Mike Ma and I offered to make Dennis a free custom burial suit and to work with his family and guide his family through the funeral planning process. So we went to Woburn, Massachusetts to meet Dennis and his family. And we first interviewed the family. Um, we went to Sunday family dinners and death cafes that are these events where people gather to talk about death over tea and cookies. We also toured cemeteries, uh, both green and, and traditional cemeteries. And then we fitted Dennis for a burial suit. And um, this was an incredibly powerful moment because Dennis is lying on the floor and his daughter and his wife and Mike and I are pinning him and measuring him for the suit. And that's when it became incredibly real. He's lying there on the floor and we just had to take a deep breath because it was this was this was the moment. Um, we also introduced Dennis and the family to uh, a group of women whom I call the Ghoul Friends. They're a group of really kick-ass ladies in New England who are leaders in the green burial movement. So death doulas, home funeral guides, uh, green cemetery founders, um, and they're all ladies. And I wanted to introduce Dennis to these ladies because I needed him to have a group of supporters, of, of experts that could surround him and support him. We also met with um, a woman, Jean Cantillon, who's a fifth generation funeral director in Woburn, Mass. And um, this is a woman that Dennis and his wife grew up with, and she will be the person taking care of his body after he dies. So what surprised me the most about going on this adventure with Dennis and his family was realizing that the suit was a beacon. It was a provocation that opened the door to deeper understanding about Dennis's family's journey and how they make decisions together. So what I learned is that it's really about the family sitting around, learning about their options, making decisions, and grappling with their really complex emotions, and working through it together. Because the reality is that, although Dennis is the person who called the shots, he wrote that email to me, he said he wants the suit, it's his family, it's his wife, his daughters, and his son who'll have to carry out his wishes. And so the funeral is really about them. And this is not an easy journey to go on. Um, even with the family as close and supportive as the whites, you know, sort of historical family tensions and problems bubble to the surface. But I think that confronting death and planning for it really has some incredible benefits. As Dennis's son Marshall says, it's brought us closer together in a weirdly contentious way. One night after dinner, when we were sitting around after dessert, um, mm -hmm. just sort of talking, something really beautiful happened. And spontaneously, Dennis's wife and his kids just started telling these beautiful story about Dennis, about his pranks, his adventures, his generosity, his love for wild parties that bring in half the town, just how special and amazing and how loved he was. Um, he, and he heard directly from them, he's sitting right there. So it was a really beautiful, spontaneous living funeral. And I totally think this is the way to go, right? Because screw the funeral eulogy. Don't you want to hear how amazing and loved you are while you're still living and not while you're in a coffin? Thank you. So this journey has also given a sense, given Dennis a sense of control in the face of an illness for which he has no control. There's no cure for PPA. 
Um, and every day is just a slow degeneration. So like, not, like Dennis, none of us have control over if we'll die. And we're all terminal, of course, um, but we can have a say in how we go. And for Dennis, he wants to go out with a bang as, as he's lived his life. Dennis is my hero, um, because although I may wear the burial suit, and I may grow mushrooms that will eat my body when I die, I am definitely no death-defying Jedi. Um, and the truth is, frankly, I am really scared to die. So this is a picture of me. This next picture is a picture of me and my brother at my grandfather's um, burial site in Korea. Next slide, please. As a kid, I watched um, someone very close to me become very consumed by grief after suddenly losing a parent. And 30 years later, that grief still has a chokehold on her. It's like PTSD. And psychologists call this complicated grief. And, and for me, in witnessing this grief, this kind of unending, consuming grief, I started to believe something about death, that when someone you deeply love dies, a part of you dies as well. And that death is an end. It's an abyss. This is what I learned as a child. Years later, I lived in a house with four terrific roommates in Boston. And one of my roommates, Eileen, uh, struggled for a long time with mental illness. And one day, she committed suicide. And my other roommates organized a memorial service for her that would happen in our house. And on the day of the service, I walked up to the door of our house. I looked into the, into the window um, in the living room where I could see all of Eileen's gathered, all, all of Eileen's friends gathered to mourn her and to celebrate her life. And I couldn't go inside. Um, I turned around and I just hightailed it out of there. I just ran. I couldn't face the reality that my friend had died, that she was gone. And it's the thing that I am least proud of, proud of in my life. And I didn't understand then that I was in deep death denial, that I was really scared of death, and that's why I just couldn't go to that funeral. Um, but I did begin to understand it when I had a death scare, and I found out that I could have a potential illness. I'm healthy now, um, but back then I was just very, very scared, and unsure of whether or not I had a future. Um, and so, again, what did I do? I ran. And during the next six years, I moved across the U.S. six times. I lived in seven different cities, and I hopped back and forth between North America, Asia, and Europe. And being rootless, it sounds crazy, but, but being rootless for me was a blessing because I got to travel the world and really talk to people from all over about death and the project. And one of the things I learned is that there's a spectrum of death acceptance. You know, on the one hand, we have people who are very much accepting of death, like Dennis, and on the other hand, which is where somewhere I am, is um, people who are in death denial. And where we land on that spectrum really has a lot to do with our childhood experiences, our culture, our relationship to the natural world, and the losses that we experience over our life. Some of us are brave like Dennis, and others are afraid like I am. Um, in Germany, I heard a lot of people tell me, you know, of course the mushrooms eat you. What else do you think happens? Um, it's not something I've heard a lot in the US. <laughs> And around this time when I was just traveling a lot, I started working with a, an executive coach, Sandy Carter, and she's really helped me to understand that, um, that my greatest weakness, my fear of death, is also the source of my life's mission. And that is to create a cultural shift and understanding that death is a moment of transformation. It's not an end. And that returning to the earth and reuniting with the trees and the soil and the air is a source of potentially deep healing and hope. So these are the mountains north of Atlanta, Georgia, where I spent most of my childhood hiking, camping, and picnicking with my family. And for me to imagine that someday I will be a part of that soil, that air, that water, and that I can provide a benefit to this landscape somehow <laughs> is deeply satisfying um, and gives me a sense of peace and calm. So my company, Coeo, that grew out of the work, has also been transformed by working so closely with Dennis and his family. 
Uh, we're not just making products, we're working to inspire people to confront death and their own death denial. And we're also guiding and supporting families in their journey. As part of this work, we're working with zero waste designers like Daniel Silverstein to make burial suits for people. Um, we're also making burial containers for pets. Our first user was a cat named Bonus, who was buried under a lemon tree in LA just a few weeks ago. Pets are important to us not only because they're family members, but because children's experiences of death their first experiences of death are often through the loss of a pet. And I really believe that we have an opportunity to teach children that death is sad, and it's something that we can't take away. We can't minimize that sadness. But death doesn't have to be scary. It is a natural part of life, and it can provide a source of meaning. So in addition to pet owners, we're working with other families like Dennis and his family, following them and guiding them on their end-of-life journeys. <laughs> And as with Dennis's family, we get, close to, we get close to the families we work with. And we mourn, but we mourn on the sidelines. And to me, to be able to mourn on the sideline is an incredible honor and privilege. Thank you so much.